been working real hard in Andover on our singing, but uh, it's always good to come home here and then do some singing too. <laughs> Appreciate being with you guys tonight, and I want to thank the congregation for uh, the graduation uh, ceremony award event last Sunday night. Boy, was that an event. And uh, I, I was telling the, the, the people in Andover, I was like, I'm trying to think when the last time we had that many seniors <laughs> in, a, in a group of, of, of people in the congregation. It, it was truly an event. And I uh, thank Marie and Matt and just everybody I can think of that was a part of that and did Jed and, and uh, was all the ladies and the, the, the food and everything. It was just, it was a remarkable moment and event. And I, I, I hung around Marvin too long, so my, my eyes were working. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to, to see what all was going on, but it was a it was an emotional moment for me. And I, I again, I deeply appreciate everyone that, that lent a hand last Sunday night, and what a special evening that was. And just just to give you a brief uh, catch up on everything I've been up to for just a quick moment. Uh, Boy, it's been a whirlwind of a year for me. Uh, last year, I changed teaching jobs, and that affected many other things, and and uh, the work in Andover and everything that's going on there. There's been a, let me just say this: there's been a lot of providence involved in that, and uh, it has been a lot that has gone into that. My mom and all the events of her uh, situation, you may or may not know, but she had a stroke uh, as a result of complications of a heart procedure. And being over there and being able to watch after dad and being able to deal with what's going on there, there's just been a lot <laughs> of providence. And the good news in her case is that there may be a, 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 a way that she may be going home pretty soon. And uh, not that she's ready, <laughs> but uh, she, she may get to go home and there may be a lot of good that comes from that also. Uh, in, in the grand scope of things, and we're looking forward to everything that happens there. And then I would encourage you, yeah, over there we're praying a lot for her, and if you want to keep praying for her, it will do a lot uh, towards uh, her improvement. Uh, she's only got a few more months to recover from the stroke as much as she can, and then the results of that will be lasting. So uh, it's one of those things where any progress she can make, you know, and the uh, last time I was there, she could move her arm about that far. So <laughs> dramatic progress from where she started. It was uh, uh, quite a, a paralysis at the, at the onset. So uh, we'll just hope for the best and keep praying for her and uh, and uh, many other things that are happening there and uh, it's just been a lot of good that's come from everything that's gone on there and uh, teaching young students now that I, 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 I traded in all those old kids for all these little guys <laughs> and uh, teaching the younger kids first grade especially has been a, a lesson in patience and uh, uh, Telling the principal that I work with now, I was like, man, that first grade is something else. She's like, yeah. <laughs> and we joke about it now, but at the beginning of the year, wow, there was a, no small amount of anxiety. And that takes a lot on an old band director like me. Uh, but those little guys definitely gave me a run for my money, and it's been, been a good growing experience and an uh, opportunity to add a lot of uh, skills to my tool belt that I hadn't had the opportunity to do, and plus it's been a nice break. Uh, I had really worked a lot through the years, and to have a change of pace and to have a change of a lot of things has been actually very, very, very important. Um, I want to thank Jed last night for his uh, message. How long have you been preaching on Amos? How long have you been on Amos? Just that one night? Yeah, okay. Yeah, boy, it was a lot of fun. And uh, one, of my, one of my very favorite statements in the scriptures is early in Amos, where it says, the Lord roars from Zion. <laughs> I love that, you know, and, and, and you made the point in the, in the message that he was a shepherd. I, I just, I, it blows my mind to this day when I think of Amos, the shepherd of Tekoa, that God took this shepherd <laughs> instead of a prophet or a minister or a Levite or something like that to do the work that Amos did. And Amos, wow, did he have a message to deliver. And I thank you so much for delivering that because was, it was just wonderful to be here and to be part of that. Um, I have been uh, doing a sermon series uh, this last several weeks <laughs> and uh, it's called Laws for Life. And I've been speaking on the Ten Commandments and going through many things there. And I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but I am going to talk about Psalm 19. So if you have your Old Testament and you want to open to Psalm 19, <laughs> one of the things I started the year with a sermon series called Signs for Life. 
And that was a set of messages on the ten plagues. And in my, in my own view of the scriptures, I find those things as very, very, very wonderful and important. And I know that in my kids' development, they had not heard much preaching on it. And so I really wanted to take the opportunity. I know some of us have been, that have been around, well, we heard the ten plagues over and over as a kid. <laughs> Well, the younger generation, not the case, you know. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that I took some time to uh, impress some of those concepts. And also, when it came to the, 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 notion, of the notion of the Ten Commandments, I know that uh, some of the young people that I work with hadn't heard a lot of preaching and teaching on that either, compared to what I heard as a kid. And I, I look back at all the preaching I heard as a kid. I look back at all the things I was able to learn and how fortunate I was as a kid to hear what I heard. And I think, wow, I had quite a legacy left to me that I need to leave. And so in this case, it's been a sense of urgency in uh, bringing some of this information forward because there are some, of, there's some that have not heard like we have, like some of us have. And so we have been looking at these different principles and, and in a sense, kind of discovering anew the, the dr dramatic importance of what God established for the, the people of Israel. We live in a time today where we're at a crossroads, aren't we? We're at a crossroads, and maybe we've already crossed it in some cases, you know, where this sense of law, decency, morality, and those things is, uh, wow, where are we? You know, and we look at some of the things that are going on in our culture and in our government and our school system and all over the place, and we say, what, what, what's going on? And one of the things as we look at God's will and God's word and God's law, boy, do we see a path in life that I, and I'll just say this as, as clearly as I can, so critical for us, so important, you know, so important to understand that God has given us a way to live in this world. It is not as the world would say to us where you get a, it, you get a pick, <laughs> you know, you get to pick which rules you like and you get to pitch which laws you think are great and you, you get this. God, then the Bible would say that's not quite the way this works. And ultimately, the, the importance of this leads to the fact that when God's law is established and when God's rules followed and when God's principles are adhered to, let me say it this way, that which is best becomes ours. That which is best. And ultimately, we live in a world today that I don't, I really don't know what they are after. You know, when they advocate for some of the things that they advocate for, I'm not really sure what they think they're going to end up with, and I don't think they know either. <laughs> I'd really like to talk to them. You know, I'd really like to say, where is this going to take you? You know, I, <laughs> I've been referencing the concept of progress in some of the lessons that I've been preaching, and some of the things that I see, if you were to take the Bible and you say, are we going forward in the Scriptures or backward? <laughs> And if you look at what's going on out there, they're not going forward in the scriptures. They're going backward. You know, I, I see what's going on in our society. I see what's going on in our culture. Boy, it sure reminds me of Sodom and Gomorrah a lot more than a, a lot of other things. Where are they going? What do they mean by progress? If these other things are so important, why did God treat them the way that he did? And why was God's response to these things what it was? If these things are progress, you know, and ultimately when we want to make biblical progress, which I think is very important, <laughs> ultimately we want to make biblical progress and biblical movement forward in our lives, well then we really need to understand how that's possible. And it really does start with what laws we live by. And it really does start with what, <laughs> what, what sense of morality God has given and established to us. And I would like you to just notice a couple things here from this magnificent psalm. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. We live in a world today that would say, what? <laughs> what? The heavens declare what? They're just there. Really? Are they? Are they just there? Did they just happen? Not, really, not according to the word of God. Not according to the word of God. According to the word of God, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
They don't just happen to be. They actually have a message to us. They actually have something that they say to us. They actually describe to us what I call the grandeur of God's power. I learned a song last summer called God and God Alone is what? Fit to take the universe's throne. I would say, yeah, this is a whole entire universe to command. Who's going who's gonna to be in charge of that? Who's going to command all these stars to do what they do? Who's going to command all these things to be what they are? God and God alone. No one else has the wisdom. No one else has the insight. No one else has the understanding of what all is happening there. And our scientists, yeah, they're trying. <laughs> they're trying to count all those stars out there. I don't think they'll ever get it done. But God knows. God knows how many there are. You know, I, I do a, an afternoon series over in Andrew called Great Passages of Scripture. And when we were in Isaiah, God says, tell me how many stars there are. You, you think you know so much about your world. Tell me about that. And then, and then tell me how much water is in the ocean because I can measure it in my hand, God says. <laughs> you, you know so much. Tell me that. And he goes on and on. Tell me how much sand is on the seashore, God says. If you know so much, tell me that. And what the psalmist is saying here is the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And they truly are the work of his hands. They truly are the work of his hands. And day after day they pour forth speech. I think this is a remarkable point. He's talking about how each day they say to us that we still have a God and we still live in his world. I love the, the song that we sing. This is the day what, that the Lord has made. What will we do? I will rejoice and what? Be glad in it. How remarkable is it that we are given a day that we can use and rejoice in the fact that God has made it for us and that God has given us this purpose and this path in life and God has shown us his mercy and his wonders in the, just the fact that we have a day today. And what a remarkable day it is, Mother's Day. I preached a Mother's Day sermon today. I was terrified. (laughs) I tried my best to get out of it. I was going to have Gary preach for me. I made it through, I only cried one time. You know, I made it through, I only cried one time. It was one of those things where I was just, I I, I said, I got to (laughs) try. You know, but as God speaks to this world, what does he say? He would say to it, world, I made this day for you. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to use it for good? Or are you going to do something else? And boy, isn't there something for us to consider there. Night after night, they display knowledge. In other words, the day says one thing, the night says something else. No, what if if the sun doesn't come up tomorrow? And we're abandoned to the darkness of the universe. Wow, we learn real quick. (laughs) <laughs> how important God's light is. I've, I've, I've always found it fascinating that the first thing that God created was light. You know, let there be light, and it was so. Let's turn on the lights, <laughs> God says, when he starts all things. Let's, let's start with that. And what a remarkable principle here for us to consider. And then he says in verse 3, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, no matter where you live, you can't escape the fact that the sun comes up and it dictates your work day. <laughs> and it dictates how long you have. Jesus says night is coming when no man can work. You know, night is coming when no man can work. You have a day and God has, told, has dictated how long it will be. And God has dictated what the nature of it will be, whether it be hot or cold or rainy or whatever. Many of us were like, well, let's trade yesterday for today's weather. <laughs> you know, let's just make that flip, you know. But, but God says, no, I, I, I have said these things. And there is no place where this isn't heard. He says, verse 4, their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Paul often describes in the book of Romans that the world is no excuse. And many people are very frustrated by that. They say, well, I have an excuse not to believe in God. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because that sun tells you there's a God. And that moon tells you there's a God. And this earth you live in tells you there's a God. And the stars out there tell you there's a God. And that wind that blows, boy, did it blow this morning, (laughs) will wake you up and tell you there's a God. There's little about this world that won't tell you that there's a God. 
very little that won't. And in the, the end of all things, that's going to be the conversation. How come you didn't understand what my world was saying to you? How come you didn't understand what my world was speaking? Because that's what it was saying. This is why Jesus said, if these children don't cry out who I am, what will happen? These stones will cry out who I am. So if our young people don't declare the glory of God and tell and do all the wonderful things they do, then the stones will start, and we don't want that. <laughs> it's much better if we fill that role and we give God the glory and we tell God all the wonders that he's done and we tell people about it. We don't want the rocks doing our job. It's much better if we do it. And in the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. This is a wonderful description of the, of the morning, isn't it? Verse 5, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. In other words, what a great celebration each morning is. What a great victory over the night and the darkness <laughs> each sunrise represents. What a great victory of God's grace and glory each day means. What a, what a momentous thing. You know, we really do need to see our world this way, don't we? We really do need to see our world from the perspective of God's grace and his power. He says in verse 6, It rises at one end of the heaven and makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is hidden from its, <clears throat> nothing is hidden from its heat. In other words, everything is affected by it, no matter what, no matter what they are. You know, and again, the point God is making is, this is all because of my will. This is all because of my power. You know? Then we get to the point here that I would just really like you to notice tonight. He says all of that is really kind of as a dramatic opening, doesn't he? <laughs> I love the Psalms. I, I love the fact that they, they, they get our attention. I love the fact that they remind us of some very important principles. And then they often tell us some really, really fascinating things. And he, the psalmist says in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. We used to have the Ten Commandments in, every, I think, almost every courthouse in this country. <laughs> we used to have the Ten Commandments on the wall of most of the schools, if not all of the schools in this country. And I can tell you that when they took those out of our courthouses, when they took those out of our schools, progress was not the result. A sense of order and decency was not the outcome. If you've looked at what's happening in California over the last little while and the problems that they're having there since they have taken these rules out of their courts, and you look at all the people that are homeless there, and you look at the crime there, and you look at what happens when someone kills someone there and they say, oh, you didn't mean it. You just, made, you just, made it, uh, you, you, you just had an accident, a lapse of judgment. No, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> thou shalt not kill is what God says. And if you allow a society to dismiss this principle, you're going to create a situation like you have there where everybody's leaving. And everybody says, this isn't a place worth living. This isn't a place fit for humanity. It doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work when we take God's law and we say, oh, oh, these people didn't mean it. It's okay. No. God's law and God's will is there to protect us. God's, there, God's will is there to help us in our life. And it says in the next verse, reviving the soul, the next part of that verse. I, I think it's fascinating that the writer of this psalm spent, it seems to me, dramatic amounts of time <laughs> peering in to the laws of God. I know as a kid, I thought they were fascinating. And I thought they led to a dramatic understanding of our lives. And it seems to me that the psalmist seems to be working on the same wavelength, if you will. He, he says, you know, I have this job and I have the opportunity. And if we, we say this is a psalm of David, which it is. <laughs> I have this opportunity of, and this responsibility of leading God's people. And I've got to make the rules, and I've got to help people follow, and I've got to decide what this is going to look like. And I've got to institute for these people and judge and do all the things that he has to do. Well, yeah, the laws of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. And in his efforts at leading God's people, and one of the things about David was he, at least in the early part of his life, did some dramatic achievements here, didn't he? 
he actually started to make these things what they needed to be. Not so the kings after him. This is one of the reasons why Israel runs into so much trouble is because the laws of the Lord become problematic for them. That's why Jesus said in the, the, the conversations he had with all the scribes and Pharisees, haven't you heard it is written? Don't you know what the Bible says, Jesus says to them? Don't you know what this law is? Don't you understand what this actually means? And Jesus went round and round and round and many, many, many numerous examples, reminding them that they already know what they're supposed to do, reminding them that they already have a, a very, very, very good law, reminding them that they already have been shown many important things. He says that the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. I knew I was never going to go to a really fancy college. <laughs> and I knew that the high school I went to was not an upper echelon institution. <laughs> I knew that the curriculum that I was subjected to there was not a high profile thing. And I knew that when I was done, they weren't going to be coming to me, handing me these fantastic job opportunities. And I knew the same thing when I graduated from an illustrious institution here in town, that when I graduated from that, I was not going to be given many wonderful opportunities for a career. In fact, when I graduated from Wichita State, I took a job washing dishes at Pizza Hut. I had a college degree. I still to this day want to take that college degree and burn it. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was worth, a dishwashing job. You know, and when we look at these principles here, where he says the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, much more so than the education that I received. And when we look at what is going on in our society today, the problems in higher education, the problems in education, the problems in many aspects of these things, we have some serious issues because they are not leading people to where they need to go. They're not getting people where they need to be. They're not getting the opportunities that these individuals need. And this is why we talk about the jobs report and how bad it is. <laughs> and the lack of opportunities. And some people saying, well, this is a job opportunity. Really? $8 an hour is a job opportunity? Really? Because what we're seeing here is that God is wanting us to have something dramatically different. He says here, the statute of those are trustworthy, making wise and simple. That means a person like me can actually achieve a state of wisdom. And I've got to tell you what I've learned from God's word, and I've never got to go to preaching school or anything, but I would consider myself more dramatically educated sitting in a pew on Sunday morning than I was in all my seven years of college education. I consider our time here of more value, of greater worth, and greater accomplishment in the lives and the benefits of others, in the healing of the illnesses of this life, and in the carrying forward of the things that God would have us do, we achieve more here than anybody ever will there. And boy, do we need to think about that. Boy, do we need to think about that. We need to recognize that what God has given us will carry us forward. He says in verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right. We got everybody in the world saying today, why are you reading that book still? <laughs> why are you still looking at that? And I would say to them, why aren't you reading this book? You know, I, I would really like to know. What is it about this book that you don't like so much? What is it about this that is such, such a concern? Because for me, it's the answer to everything. For me, it's the best solution to most of the problems that we're facing today. For me, it is a dramatic improvement on much of what I see being advocated for. And it says, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. I've never, I've never walked away from the law of God saying, you know, that, 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 that's, that, that doesn't make any sense. Most of the time, I, I walk away from the word of God and the will of God and the law of God going, Wow. What dramatic wisdom. What dramatic insight. Well, God really knew <laughs> what he was doing when he instituted this or that different, uh, various command. You know, <clears throat> he says in the next one, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. My friend, uh, Randy McCrane in Greeley, Colorado, he said he learned how to think from reading the Bible. It lied in his eyes. He said, that's how I learned how to think. <laughs> Reading God's word. And he was an English professor. 
So he read a lot. And it was one of those things where when he looked at God's word, he said, this is where the thinking really begins. This is where the heart of what we become really starts. And I can tell you that as I read the word of God, this is, it just keeps happening. <laughs> it just keeps bringing this, uh, this light and this radiance to what I see and to what God is showing me, and I can't imagine living without it. He says in the next, <clears throat> the next part of this, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. I can't imagine not having respect for God. Can't man, we were talking this morning and, and, and some of the things that we were discussing about, and I was, I was making the point, I'm so fortunate that I grew up in the church. So fortunate, you know, so fortunate that my experience, because many people's isn't, you know, that my experience is that such that I have seen so much of what God has given. And one of the things here as we, as we look at this just very briefly, the fear of the Lord is pure. I, 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 I can tell you that as I come to God and as I, as I <laughs> try to do the things that God asked me to do, the, the fear of this and the respect, I think, is so important. And as he says here, enduring forever, what a remarkable thing. It does carry us on, doesn't it? It does help us make it from one point to the next. And then he says in the next part of this, the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. I, I, I'm fascinated over and over and over with the fact that each aspect, and as I, I'm doing a message on the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> each aspect of those commandments over and over and over, none of them lead to a sense of punishment in the grand scope of things. What they are designed to lead to is a, a position of righteousness. When you don't covet <laughs> and you, you are happy with what you have, what does that bring? Contentment. Altogether righteous. You know, when, when we uh, celebrate the lives of this world and we, we recognize that God has made this life, you know, I, one writer I, I read, he says, this magnificent gift called life. How remarkable, you know. And he said that in the context of the problem of how do we financially handle all the issues of life? You know, when this or that happens in a person's life and they need all this help and they need all this care and all this, this or that, aren't they worth that? Yeah. Why? Why? Why are they worth all this money and all this care and all of this uh, effort? Because of this gift called life. Because of that. And it's because of that <clears throat> that all of this is altogether righteous. This understanding that life is so important, that God has given us life. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life. And then he said that they may have it more abundantly. In other words, that you wouldn't just live and go to work each day. <laughs> that you wouldn't just live and be exhausted and live and be exhausted and live and be exhausted and exhausted and live. But that you would have an abundant life. And I can tell you, in the church, when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light... He's not joking. <laughs> He's not joking. He is offering a way of life and a way of living that is truly easier. And is truly, as the psalmist says here, altogether righteous. Altogether righteous. Verse 10, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. In David's day, I, I, I imagine the, the, the country down the road, Egypt, <laughs> had most of the gold, right? You know, they, they, they had tremendous wealth. And David, by the time he's done, has made Israel a fairly wealthy place. Fairly wealthy empire. And you, I, I've tried for years to quantify Solomon's wealth against pharaohs of Egypt and, and many other things. And one of the things that as I look at, at Solomon's wealth, and you know, he had these thousands of people that he ate with every day and, and all of this dramatic and grand and grandiose administration and he had, what about the wives, you know? I mean, what, what about all of the opulence 
of the wealth that he had. And I think what David is saying here is the true value, the true thing of wealth, as we see in Solomon, isn't all the things, right? Because he lost it right away. When Rehoboam comes along, the wealth of Israel almost vanishes overnight. And in the mind of David, in the life of David, David made Israel great because of their laws. Because of their laws, they were great. Not because of their wealth. Egypt had all the gold and they were pitiful. <laughs> because they had the laws, they could make a great country. And how important is this lesson for us today? They are more precious than gold and m than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them your servant is warned. <clears throat> been referencing a lot of verses lately for whatever reason. <laughs> Through the, I've been studying Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, and several of our Bible classes. And, and one of the things that Paul tries to do uh, in various ways is create a system of protection. He tries to create a system of uh, protecting our minds so that in this world of struggles and in this world of dangers, you know, that we will have a fortification against them. You know, there's a song that we, we were singing here, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord, what, surrounds his people. You know, this sense that the, the walls are great, <laughs> but, when the, but when the Lord surrounds his people, now we have a true and a great protection. And the, the, the issue is this. We live in a world of tremendous danger. We live in a world, and the other problem is many people fall what? Victim to that danger. Why do they fall victim to it? Because they don't understand it. Why don't they understand it? Because they don't know the rules. I play cards with a guy at Andover named Mark Tagto. <laughs> if you ever get to meet Mark Tagto, he loves cards. <laughs> Mark is a stickler for the rules. And he often changes them through the game to his advantage. <laughs> so, so let's say Hadley's beating him in a game of cards. He'll try to manipulate the, the, the point totals and the way that you can arrive at point totals to try to get back in the game. <laughs> It's, it's really kind of a fun thing. It's kind of a fun process. <laughs> but what happens in all of this is that we live in a world that there are certain rules. And if you don't know those rules, then in many ways you can lose the game. And you can fall into some tremendous dangers. And boy, we could, we could go through a laundry list of concerns, couldn't we? You know, <laughs> my, my, my parents, it's Mother's Day so I can make one reference here. <laughs> my parents and my mom especially before I ever left the house when I was a kid, she would give me some type of warning. <laughs> she would often be like, Jesus is going with you. <laughs> Wherever you think you're going, you better watch out. You know, you better act right. You better remember what you know. That's what she would say when I would leave the house, and she was relentless. <laughs> you guys know her. <clears throat> you know, she, she was relentless in that. And what the, 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 the implication here is, by them your servant is warned, well, now I've got my warning before I leave that I better be careful. <laughs> now I've got my understanding that I'm leaving the house, and that doesn't mean I'm safe. Just because I'm a kid and just because I'm that doesn't mean I'm okay. I better be wary. I better be aware. And I can tell you that what God is saying to us and to this world is you live in a world and there are dangers. And you, as you go into your life and into what you do, boy, you need to be careful. And boy, you need to understand what can happen. And then he says on the other side of that, in keeping them, there is great reward. I just did a message on honor your father and mother. In that, in that passage, it says, Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the earth. I would call that a great reward. I would call that a great reward. In contrast, I, one, of the, one of the most difficult things I did as a kid, I, I worked with a young man at a pizza and he had a birthday. He was probably about 23 years old and he got really drunk and he drove really fast and he hit a telephone pole really hard and he didn't live to tell the tale. Standing at his grave, 
standing at his grave looking at that, shaking my head, because this kid was a million times smarter than me. This kid was a dramatically richer than me. This kid had opportunities that I will never have. This kid had so much that this life, and he would have been spectacular. He was genius, brilliant businessman. But what did he forget? We live in a world of danger. And we've got to exercise our intelligence. And we've got to be careful with what we do because otherwise we're going to lose that reward. Otherwise we're going to miss out on what it can offer. This long life that God offers us when we listen to what our parents say. And we are careful and cautious as God would have us to be. So verse 12, who could discern his errors, forgive my hidden faults? <clears throat> David recognized that in and within him there were things that he was trying to deal with. <laughs> Those of us who are familiar with the book of Romans says... Paul says in that book, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me, what, from this body of death? You know, the, this human condition that we fight and that we struggle with, and David here echoing a similar sentiment, who can discern his errors, forgive my hidden faults. He says in the next part of that, keep your servant from willful sins and may they not rule over me. This is so important. You know, at any given moment, our humanity can kind of creep into our life and start to wreak havoc on us. And if we are not willing to exercise the control here and exercise the wisdom that we need, the consequences can really start to take over pretty fast. And then he says here, may they not rule over me. What a prayer. <laughs> what a prayer. What, what a sense of wisdom and insight for us. Because... If they do, we got big issues. And what David is saying here is, may they not. Indeed, may they not. I've seen God in his mercy overlook so many things in people's lives. <laughs> it's remarkable. I, I've seen God, especially in the person of David, what did he do for David? You know, but I've seen God in, in the people's lives that I know. I've seen God work through some dramatic things. Because God is truly a God of mercy. And God is truly a God of grace. <clears throat> Finally, he ends here in verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Isn't that what we're doing here tonight? That the words of our mouths would be ple pleasing in his sight. But that doesn't have to stop here, does it? <laughs> you know, when we leave here, our words can continue to be pleasing to our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. And when we go where we go tomorrow, our words can continue to be pleasing. It doesn't have to be just here. And hopefully, it's everywhere we go. And just to highlight these last couple thoughts here, oh, Lord, my rock. I don't know about you, but I need a rock <laughs> to build my life on. You know, Robert Kiyosaki says, when you want to make a great investment, you better build a big foundation so that investment can become what it needs to be. And when you look at your life and the investment that it is and all the things that you need to make it to become, you need a rock. This is why Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on what? This rock I will what? Build my church, and what will happen? The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What a remarkable insight into what God desires for us to be. And then he says in the last part, my Redeemer. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite songs in the songbook is, I know my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know, I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. How important it is that we have a Redeemer and that he is doing all the things for us that he desires to do. And tonight, if we can pray for you, if there's anything we can do for you, we'd invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.